So I found this design on Reddit, actually, and I took it and improved it a little bit. It's a basic push-pull stereo amplifier. That's they, they claimed it was Class A, but it's really not. It's Class AB. And I built this with just stuff I found in my scrap bin. So it's a scrap box amplifier build. But it sounds really good, actually. And I'll show you how this thing works. So this is, like I said, an adaptation of another schematic I found. I'll show the picture on Reddit. Um, I was just bumping around on Reddit and found that. I'm like, you know what? I'll build one of these. I've never actually just sat down and just built one before. So I decided to give it a try. And so it's a differential input. Uh, with current mirrors to maximize the gain. And these are all transistors that I hand matched myself. I got a big batch of 2N3906s and 2N3904s and matched with a device that shows the beta and the turn on voltage at a given current. So I was able to pretty closely match them by hand. So you got your differential input. Get your current mirrors to maximize the gain. And then you have another single-ended amplifier here <clears throat> with a current mirror as an active load feeding the output stage. These are Zikli pairs. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Probably Zikli pairs, something like that. Instead of a Darlington, but it's like a PNP and an NPN transistor together for more current gain or more gain in general. And then there's a feedback loop, just a simple, uh, what they call a series feedback loop, going to the inverting input of the amplifier, the input that's gonna make the output drop if it goes high. So you have a negative feedback loop going. And then the non-inverting input, the same as a non-inverting input on an op amp, is the input. Now I didn't bother putting any bias resistors on this, it's probably bad uh, circuit design, but I haven't had any issues because when you're using this, the plug's going to be in and it's going to have a path to ground through the device that is driving it. That's the main meat of the circuit, though. There's other stuff I added to it. I added, a, you know, obviously a, an input jack and a dual gang potentiometer. If you can focus on that. Yeah, dual gang potentiometer. And I just drilled a hole in the board. I have the switch here with this op amp. I know it's kind of cheating because it's, you know, discrete transistors, but I wanted the ability to be able to bridge the amplifier. Let's show you a little schematic for that. So basically, you've got your left channel and then your right channel. And on the right channel, the incoming signal goes into an, a buffer, a unity gain buffer, and then an inverter, a unity gain inverter. And so that switch switches between the raw signal or the buffered signal, and it sets the two signals 180 degrees out of phase. And so what ends up happening is you can get up to four times the output power between the two channels to drive one load. So if I wanted to drive just one speaker, I could get four times the power doing that with this. Or I could just run it in stereo, like I kind of intended it to be in the first place. So I want it to be a nice, you know, kind of knock around versatile amplifier I can just use on stuff. Now, after I built this thing, I sort of, well, I ran all the calculations and stuff, but I sort of started realizing that it really wasn't really that good of a design, actually. I'll show you the uh, approximate gain calculations. <clears throat> so the differential amplifier by itself with these current mirrors would have a gain of over 300, approximately. These things, see these current mirrors basically behave as active resistors, or effectively they're passing current, but when the voltage on the collector changes, the current is held pretty much constant because it's, it's a current, it tries to keep the current the same in both legs, and so it kind of forces each leg to stay the same. So the voltage for a very small input is gonna change. This, of course, this resistance is not infinite. It's actually due to the early effect. It's probably in the 100K-ish region. So you could, you know, at worst case, you'd say that's probably a 100K resistor. But it's a much more efficient 100K resistor. 
And so based on that, you can calculate, yeah, this is going to be a gain of about 300. But it has an AC gain of only 31 because you're feeding this stage here, which has a low input impedance. It's, the input impedance is approximately 68 ohms, which is the emitter resistor. At the base, it's going to see beta of the transistor, which is about 150 times that. So it's going to be in the, you know, ones of K's region. I don't think I show that here, but um, basically it knocks the gain way down by a factor of about 10. And the same thing with the uh, common emitter amplifier here. You have a, you know, a, an active load here, just like we do here. So you have supposedly really high gain, even with the 68 ohm resistor. And I added that mainly for uh, stability and hopefully knocking out a little bit of distortion, but without sacrificing a whole lot of gain. However, we get the same kind of effect here where ideally we'd have a gain of seven over 700, but we end up getting a gain of only 22. And then the driver stage, these things only have uh, a gain of about one or slightly less than one. Um, actually, it's about 0.98. So you're not getting any voltage gain. It's all current gain. So that's about 0.98. So you multiply all that together and you get uh, about 57 decibels of open loop gain with no negative feedback, just wide open. It's about 57 decibels. Now, if you were to somehow preserve the gain of each stage, you get over 100 decibels of gain. And that's about what you'd see from like a typical op amp. It's about 100, a over 100 uh, decibels of gain open loop. So, and, and there's measures taken in an op amp to minimize loading of stages like this. This is not a very well optimized design, to be honest. And again, I didn't really notice that when I first looked at it. Of course, I notice it now because I just built it and I can see all its problems. One of which is actually its ability to minimize hum. I also designed a power supply with two bridge rectifiers in parallel to get more current capability and a bank of capacitors. But what I discovered is that even though the ripple current is less than a volt, the hum is god-awful. There is almost no power supply rejection in this amp. Most, time, most of the time, with these current mirrors and this push-pull and this, this differential input stage, you have some ability of knocking down any kind of hum or crap that gets in on these power rails, and it doesn't get amplified. But sadly, that's not the case with this amplifier. It's getting in injected somewhere, probably here, I don't know, and it's maybe getting fed back and... It's got problems, but anyway, so this power supply, like I said, it's intolerant to any sort of ripples. So I basically, am, right now, I'm using a regulated DC supply, dual supply. Um, and so now that we know the open loop gain, we can calculate the closed loop gain with the resistors we have set. So it's about 10.9, basically, using the negative feedback equation, um, and get a max output swing of maybe 12 volt peak to peak before we get some serious distortion going. Um, and that's running on, the original design ran on plus minus eight volts. I think I'm running a little bit higher now, um, but a little too much higher than that. It, it starts to, the KS and current heats up those output transistors and those tiny little clip on heat sinks just don't cut it. These things get pretty warm as is. And so I try not, run them too hot. And the output power of this thing running at, at about eight, eight and a half volts is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 2.2 watts. So ironically, it's about the same as the tube amplifier I have sitting around, but it's solid state and a lot lower distortion actually. So the open, the closed loop gain, we want to make sure that the maximum output swing occurs at line level basically. So if we're feeding this thing from like a laptop or a phone, that's going to output at maximum two volts peak to peak. Now, we typically want to shoot for a little less than that because the some songs may be poorly mastered or they might be a few decibels below clipping, and so we want to have some headroom there. So if the output's a little quiet, 
the amp can compensate a little bit. You can always just back off the volume knob. So that's the maximum amount of bass current with that resistor. Um, so yeah, with that amount, of, with the maximum amount of current, you're looking at 1.25 ohms of output impedance. Now closed loop, the negative feedback is going to help that even more. The loop gain, which is <clears throat> A times B, A is open loop gain, B is the uh, the ratio by which it's divided, meaning this, this ratio of these two resistors, R1 and R2. That's what B is, or beta sometimes as it's called. Um, the open loop gain in this case is like 60 ish. So you end up getting about 20 milli ohms of output impedance. That's not bad. For all the other faults this thing has, that's not bad at all. So, so I'll just show you this thing again. So it's 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 a very crisp, clear and crisp sounding amplifier. The wiring is a disaster, the power supply is kind of a disaster, it's very thrown together. But I tell you what, the sound is is very crisp. It's very I haven't actually measured the distortion on this thing yet, but it it, it picks up it amplifies transients much better than the single ended triode tube amp does. I can say that for sure. And it's such a simple design. There's no, aside from this compensation capacitor, there's really no caps in line in this at all. And so it's a very clear signal path. So any quick transients, at least in the audio band, are going to get amplified fairly, fairly cleanly. Um, and I do have, because I didn't really match these output transistors, I did make sure to add an offset null trim to this so that this this uh, differential stage can get matched properly so this sits at exactly zero volts because otherwise you have you know however many millivolts or volts sitting across your speaker directly drawing current and you know pushing a speaker cone in or out so that's not good so to get this at zero volts i'm glad i added these little trim pots right here and it worked actually a lot better than i thought it would I can trim it right down to zero, uh, zero volts, and it does drift with temperature, so it's not perfect, but as long as it's within a few millivolts, that's perfect. So that's a very basic class AB push-pull amplifier that I just threw together as a scrap box amplifier build project. I've always wanted to do one of these. Yeah, nothing special here. It's just your typical, if it focuses, typical, uh, perf board build and it was fun it was fun okay so this is my janky setup for measuring distortion on this amplifier here i got the incoming signal coming from the signal generator at two kilohertz running into one of the channels right now i can bridge the two later into this eight ohm dummy load resistor into this oscilloscope so you can see the waveform and a uh, an attenuator just a couple of resistors resistor divider going into this laptop running a fast Fourier transform display and I'll show you that so I'm running this thing pretty much right under clipping and if I push it any harder, there it goes. That's in clipping pretty hard. If I drop it back down, that's running at, uh, at this voltage, it's, it's at about 1.75 watts. And uh, that's the third harmonic, which basically sits approximately this 10 decibels per division, so about 40 decibels below the fundamental. That's about uh, 1%. Now with the, each of these added in there, it's probably a little higher than that. It's probably 2 or 3%. Well, maybe not that high. 1 to 2% right before clipping. And if I drop this down... It stays, the third harmonic kind of just stays there. 
So as you can see, this there's quite a bit of noise in here, but this is just the function generator, just this thing over here at the same frequency, similar output level, running through the attenuator. So there's some second, third harmonic distortion, and it's sitting at about that level, about 40 decibels down. So really, so really this amplifier really isn't adding any serious distortion, as you can kind of see. Okay, so this is the amp running in bridged mode at around 7 watts RMS. A fast Fourier, Fourier transform shows second, third harmonic up to about the, the sixth harmonic, seventh. Um, and as I drop it, the, the level drops quite a bit before the distortion drops down. So I'll bring it up to... See, it, cl it clips here, actually. And if I bring it just below clipping, you can see there's quite a bit more uh, upper harmonic distortion, and this is kind of what you'd expect to see with a bridged amplifier, because every each channel is not exactly symmetrical, and so at high levels you will get a little bit more distortion, but you do get a lot more power, obviously. And so this is sitting maybe uh, a little over 35, 38 decibels down. So it's uh, it's up a up a little bit, and the second harmonic is way up. It used to be the second harmonic was a few, probably 10 decibels lower at least. So this is interesting. Even though this function generator has much higher distortion than I thought it did, I was under the impression it had like 0.01% total harmonic distortion, but I guess not. But this still gives a rough you know, estimate of what an amplifier like this might add to a signal. And thankfully it's not very much. I hope you found this interesting.